It's your boy Manpreet here to drop a quick picks video for you guys for Unified MMA 48, which makes its debut in Toronto tonight at the International Center, just beside Pearson International Airport. For anybody uh, watching this and wanting to quickly uh, get their uh, tickets or anything like that you guys are more than welcome to uh come by the show come by the fights i believe tickets are still available i have a link in the description below if you guys want to come out and support unified and support local mma uh very happy that they've decided to come to toronto specifically you know the gta area um they usually put on great shows over there out west and it's no different here with the card that they brought to toronto uh, and it features a lot of guys that i'm familiar with guys that i've known since their come up and uh, i thought i would offer up some quick picks for anybody looking to get some action down on the fights tonight right after this i'm gonna hop in the shower get all uh dazzled up and then head on down to the fight so if you're out there and if you guys see me Hit me up, say what up, and I'll be happy to say hi and uh, enjoy the fights as well. So, uh, like I said, first show in Toronto for Unified MMA tomorrow, I believe, or Sunday. They actually have another show out west, so they're running a back-to-back -back here uh, this weekend. And what better way, right? Like UFC has their last event this weekend of the year, uh, and Unified getting in on it as well. Uh, I want to give a special thank you to all of the guys involved with Unified, from Sonny Serene to to the matchmaker uh, Rob Vivers to you know um, Aaron Bronstetter, who's going to be doing commentating for them, uh, John Pollock, Mike Malott, Star Studded Crew, John Ramdean as well, going to be on the call. So if you can't make the fights in person, they'll actually be on Fight Pass as well, so you can you know get your action down and then watch the fights on Fight Pass. Uh, another great way of going about it as well. All right. Let's get right into it. I'm going to rifle through a couple of these early ones, and then we can talk a little bit more about the top of the card. First fight of the night between Amin Al-Malik going up against Christian Bouchard. Now, in terms of odds, you got minus 400 on Christian Bouchard and plus 300 on Amin Al-Malik. Now, Al-Malik, I've... I'm somewhat familiar with him. I know he trains down there at Niagara Top Team, which is one of the budding gyms coming out of the Southern Ontario region. They got a handful of guys on this card as well, but they are a team that is, you know, very much on the rise. Uh, I'd say the most notable fighter at this point in time on the big stage is Jasmine Jazdovicious. Uh, obviously, the last fight not going her way, but she still has a ton of potential and uh, they have a solid coaching staff and a solid amount of bodies in that gym for guys to get solid training. Now, for I mean, he shows a cur currently shows an 0 2 record in MMA, and I think that's why uh, you know the odds are so skewed in Christian Bouchard's favor because he has two wins already in his short three fight career. Uh, Al Malik's losses both coming this year. He did turn pro back in March, came up short in BFL, and then took a fight in BTC in July and came up short that night as well. Uh, his striking looks to be on point, throws with a lot of bad intentions, has some good combinations. And I know working down there at Ni Niagara Top Team, they're going to be rounding out the rest of his game, especially his grappling, which is something that, uh, you know, it's a pretty big call card for a lot of the fighters out of that gym based on the fact simply that their head coach is one of the top wrestlers uh in all of canada so very happy uh to see al malik getting that uh you know work and that love down there uh he's going up against christian bouchard who uh, you know it's coming up on a year now since he's last competed and his last fight which was a loss actually came to uh al malik's uh training partner tisha gutro who also fights later on on this card christian seems to be a decent striker as well came up short in the Tiche fight because of the grappling. And I'm expecting Amin to go out there and take a little bit of that blueprint that Tiche laid out and uh, try to apply it here. So I don't really understand the line here at minus 400 on Christian. I truly think it's just because of the record. I think they might have wiki capped this fight, if anything. Um, but I think Al Malik is a very solid underdog tonight. And I do think he can go out there and pull off an upset victory. Again, this is still lower level MMA. We're talking about guys, you know, two, three, four fights into their career. Odds shouldn't be this wide for that. And I think Al Malik has a good enough chance based on the odds to go out there and spring the upset in the first fight of the night. Let's move on to the next fight where we have Matt Special going up against Mohamed Addo. I believe Mohamed Addo is a late addition to this card as Jesse Smith was forced to pull out of it. Not much I could find on Mohamed. You know, I mean, you guys know I'm that guy to go out there and uh, scrounge for tape and go to the deepest, darkest parts of the web to find it. But I couldn't really find much on Mohamed. Uh, he has a kickboxing fight 
back in August of 2020, uh, just based off of uh, what I'm seeing here on Tapology, uh, based off his Instagram, seems to be more of a, a kickboxer striker type. Matt Spessio, uh, a specialist in almost every realm of MMA, right? He's 4-0, still young in his career. He's been splitting time, I believe. Uh, I, I could be off on this between Niagara top team and Jazuka. Uh, Jazuka. <laughs> Uh, Bazooka Joe, uh, kickboxing over there in the Scarborough area. So very well-rounded striking that we could see from him here. Uh, that's definitely what he's going to need going up against a guy like Mohamed Addo. Uh, but I do lean on the Special side. My only concern, wide odds, right? We're talking about minus 600 here on Matt Special, who, you know, deserves to be the favorite because he has more... Um, he has more experience under his belt, uh, great training partners as well. Uh, been around the game for a while. Mohammed coming in on short notice, not really preparing for this date as long as Mr. Matt Special has been. So uh, very intrigued to see how this fight plays out. But I do lean more so on the Matt Special side here. Just don't know if I want to pay that type of chalk on him in this matchup. Next up. Let's talk about a fight that I'm very excited for because it has to do with a fighter that I am very closely tied to. Uh, let me see here real quick. All right. Uh, so, uh, Ergis Segeta. This is a fighter that I am very, very uh, familiar with. Um, you know, young kid, 25 years old. He walked into Grant's MMA, I want to say almost 10 years ago now, but maybe nine years ago at this point. Uh, that was at the time when I was working at the gym as a general manager. And he came into the gym specifically as a wrestler. That's what he was doing in high school. And that's what his focus was when he first came into the gym. Then he started tinkering with the MMA style, right? That gym that I was working at was mainly known for its boxing, even though we had MMA fighters there. So he started working on his striking, really started to round it out, and then got that, that urge, that itch to start competing in MMA and he uh, has been successful ever since stepping into the cage for the first time as an amateur back in November of 2014. He has an undefeated amateur and pro record, the only kind of holdup on his career and he killed himself for this and I don't think we'll ever see him make this mistake again is that he, he missed weight for one of his amateur fights and I think he really took that to heart and I've seen this guy really dial it in and he goes out there and you know uh, he had a long layoff between this fight and his prior fight which took place in December of 2018 gained a little bit of weight I'll, I'll let him know that he obviously uh, it wasn't a hiding or anything like that but once he knew that he was finally over the whole COVID situation and can finally go out there and compete. And especially with Unified coming to town here, this guy has really notched it together, really tied it together and, uh, you know, got his weight down, obviously made weight yesterday, Very looked in very good shape too. Uh, the guy has a very difficult style to deal with. He is a very strong wrestler. Like, that's why I think this kid is so special. Just to give you guys an idea, he had another opponent matched up for this card named Mark Gardner, three and three fighters, six fights. And they lined Ergis again at minus 1,200. That's how much they think of this guy, as, as do I. Again, I might be a little bit biased. It also might be because he was one of the first ever fighters that I sponsored. Team Rhino. I sponsored him for one of his uh, TKO fights back in the day. And I believe he still has a hat somewhere. I won't be rocking it tonight. Obviously, I got to look a little bit more fancy than rocking a hat. But... Um, you know, I, I saw the promise in this kid from, from the jump, and I think that now that he's getting back into it, um, we will see him climb the uh, regional ranks and maybe make it to the big show in the next couple of years or so. But uh, he wasn't just sitting on the couch either, you know, from 2018 to, to now. He's been working hard with his jiu-jitsu, achieved his black belt. I believe it's been a year or so now. The kid is very determined, and I do think that he's going to give Casey Radon some issues here. Casey coming in on a bit of short notice here. 3-0 and professional, but we do see the issues in his game when you do watch the tape. There are guys that are able to take him down and grind him out and have some good success from on top. But he is able to work back to his feet, get back to his handiwork, which is what he specializes in in his striking. But I do think that Ergis Segeta is going to be the toughest opponent that he has faced to date. Ergis will be very heavy on top, and I don't think he'll be giving up as many get-ups as the past opponents of Rad Radon have, and I think it's going to cause him some issues here. So, again, you may say that I'm biased or not, but I really think that this is a great stylistic matchup for Segeta to go out there and get his hand raised. The one holdup people might have is the fact that he hasn't been active over the last four years or just under four years. I promise you, this guy has been working at his craft the entire time. May have gained a little bit of weight, like I said, but when he, time came, 
He dialed it all in. He's back. He made weight perfectly yesterday, uh, and he looks completely ready to go. And I know for a fact that he should go out there and grind this victory out. So give me Ergis to get a. I wouldn't even be surprised if he gets a finish here, but. Uh, yeah, I, I I I think his money line is a decent enough spot here at that minus one fifty range. So give me Ergus, Ergus. Uh, I, I'm not even going to give you a method. I, I don't know how he's going to win, but it should come through the grappling realm. Speaking of grappling, next up we got Gabe Sagman going up against Louis Jordan. Louis, obviously the uh, younger brother of Charles Jordan, who we obviously know in the UFC. But Louis, that that's a kid that I have a little bit of history with as well. Back in 2014 for his last uh, amateur fight, I was actually helping corner his opponent, Hashmat Suari. Probably one of the greatest fights I've ever seen, especially on an amateur rank scene, right? Both guys going back and forth with the grappling, with the striking, both guys getting hurt, both guys really digging deep to try to get the win. And it turns out to be a draw. Very close fight. And I think the draw was a perfect representation of it. Uh, Louis starts off his MMA professional MMA career pretty good at 3-0. Uh, you know, getting a lot of love from that Quebec fighting over for TKO and, and Rec MMA. Spending the majority of his career under TKO. But he did fall on some tough times against guys like Tyler Wilson and Atsushi Fujino. But uh, he, he's really trying to round out the rest of his skill set. You see him taking boxing matches. And in the last couple of years, he's put together a 3 and one boxing record. Uh, but his last professional MMA fight came in January of 2021 when he fell short against uh, Avilion Hamidov for UAE Warriors. Uh, that was a fight where he's going to be fa like he faced something similar to what he's going to be facing here with Gabe, which is a takedown heavy approach from his opponent. But I was quite impressed with his ability to, you know, one stop the takedowns. And even when he was taken down, working back to his feet and then getting back to his handiwork, his striking is going to be his huge advantage in this matchup compared to Gabe Segman, who BJJ black belt seven and five. He is a, you know, I don't want to call him a journeyman because I believe people would think that's an insult, but the guy's been around the game for a while. He's fought the highs and the lows uh, over his last, what is that? Five fights. He's put together a three, and two record but his last fight shows as to why i think that louis jordan will likely win this matchup noah ali was able to stop the takedowns and keep this fight in the striking realm where he was able to piece up gabe which is where gabe kind of slacks a little bit uh i'm sure he's working on it i'm sure he's trying to round out that part of his game especially working over there at house of champions mma down in st Catharines. i believe it's st Catharines hamilton area shout out to crew alin uh mainly known for their muay thai but his muay thai in a striking game is still developing on a you know on a year to year basis. So I don't know if it's going to be enough of an improvement since back in May to now to deal with that striking approach from Louis Jordan, who fights very similar to his brother, very uh, good power, well, solid power, good striking, good striking fundamentals, likes to get flashy at times. But I think the main point here for Louis is stopping those takedowns, or if he is taken down, getting back to his feet, which I've seen him do on tape and getting back to his striking, which I think he'll be able to do here. The line I won't lie, minus 275, a little bit wide. I'd be a little bit uh, skeptical to take it just in case Gabe is able to secure those positions. So I don't want to pay too much chalk on that. But I do think that Louis Dordain still goes out there, gets his hand raised, and uh, hopefully starts putting together a couple more fights because he is an exciting prospect, even though he only holds a 5-3 and three professional MMA record. I am whizzing on through it here right now. It's uh, absolutely insane. Uh, so I apologize for anybody if I'm talking too fast here. Just want to get these out there so I can get ready and get out there and enjoy the fights as well. All right, next up, we got Vladimir Kazbakov going up against Jesse Stern. Minus 140 on Stern and plus 110 on Kazbakov. Now Stern, most people might remember him for his quick stint on PFL. I believe he... Uh, no, he did not compete in contention series, but he mainly competed on PFL the 2021 season. He came up short in both of his fights against Shaman Marais and Anthony Dizzy, but he is currently riding a two-fight winning streak, most recently picking up a victory on my birthday, October 22nd of this past uh, year, winning via rear naked choke in the dying seconds of that first round. Level of competition has been a little bit skeptical, but I do think that he is perfectly prepared for this matchup against Vladimir Kazbakov. Kazbakov is a little bit of a character up here in uh, the Toronto area. You know, he he did the whole uh, Kobe Covington shtick the last time I saw him go out there and fight. I believe that was back in... Uh, I could be off here, but I think it was like 2017 that I went to go see him fight. Uh, obviously, I had other like teammates and stuff on the card. I didn't go just strictly to see him, but you know, the guy throws on the mega hat, does the whole spiel and all that stuff. Uh, interesting 
uh, character, to say the least. But a uh, decent fighter. You know, he has some big power in his hands, as he showed off in his last fight. Knocking out his opponent in 18 seconds has a decent ground game as well. But I do think that Jesse Stern is more than up to task here, being the slightly better technical striker. He may not have as much big power, but I'd be interested to see how well Kazbakov is able to employ his wrestling here should he go that way. Now, just because he has an of in his name doesn't mean he's going to go out there and just absolutely Khabib this guy. You know, he has a 7-4 and four record, and he's a decent fighter, but I'm not 100% sure that he can go out there and, and deal with the striking onslaught that's going to be coming from the Jesse Stern side of things here. Uh, tough fight to call. I don't really like the, you know, the chalk here on the Stern side just because he has more experience against high level of opponents. Uh, Kazmikov could be live at plus 110, but I will pick Jesse Stern as my official prediction for this matchup. Next up, we're going to be talking about Mike Hill, who comes in at plus 165, going up against Pat Pitlick, who's coming in at minus 205. Now, Mike Hill, a lot of people will remember him for his stint on The Ultimate Fighter years ago, where he fell short against Mike Ricci and then didn't get the call back to the UFC after that. Um, he you know, did stumble a couple times over his next couple fights, losing fights to Joel Powell and Ryan Ford. He did manage to pick up wins over Ryan Dixon, Mark Drummond, Spencer Jab, uh, you know, a couple other big names as well. Cody Cran, Matt Krako, you know, staples within the MMA scene up here in Canada. But right now he's riding in 0-3 run over his last three fights, losing to Bobby Lee, who is a, you know, I believe he's competed on Bellator a couple of times and CFFC. We saw Bobby just use utilize his grappling, get him to the mat immediately and just control him for the majority of 15 minutes. Ryan Dixon, I believe that was his comeback fight after having years off from competition, came into that fight, got my kill down immediately, choked him out within a minute of that fight, got the dub there. And then he goes out there and gets knocked out by Stefan Beaumont back in September, uh, a minute and 12 seconds into that matchup. I do think he's going to be completely outstruck here by a guy in Pat Pitlick, who has a great Muay Thai background, uh, very solid striker, utilizes his range very well, started his MMA career 7-0 and before running into UFC veteran Jake Lindsay back in March of 2019. Now he's taken off just over three and a half years from competition, but I do think he's been still sharpening his tools and just becoming a better striker and honing in on his craft. And I think that will be enough for him to go out there, stop the potential takedown offense that's going to be coming from the Mike Hill side. Because I think if this fight is in the striking realm, Pitlick will be the one having the advantage here, lighting him up and possibly knocking him out. So I understand the minus 205 line on him. I think it's a solid spot as well for Pitlick to pick up the, the biggest win of his career over the biggest name of his career to date. So Pat Pitlick, KO, minus 205, throwing a parlay, play it straight. I think it's a good spot. Next up, we got Tisha Gutro going up against Morgan Rhines. Minus 1,000 on Tisha Gutro. Obviously, a big uh, plus money on the other side with Morgan Rhines coming in at plus 600. Tisha is one of those guys that I've been hearing about for the last couple of years. He has a 6 and 1. Uh, professional MMA record. His only loss is a fight that he took on short notice in LFA. Uh, it was his first fight with LFA. Um, you know, they weren't really doing him any favors considering it looked like he was severely undersized in that matchup. He normally fights at 135 pounds, took that fight at 140 pound catch weight, uh, ended up losing that fight. It was a 1 1 fight going into that third round, and it looked like his opponent, Justin Wetzel, just had a little bit more left in the tank, a little bit more preparedness for that date and was able to grind out that last round, pick that victory up by decision. But since then, he's gone on a three-fight winning streak, defeating a fighter that is also competing on this card, Christian Bouchard, knocked him out in the third round back in November of 2021. And his last two fights took place in CFFC and LFA, where he was able to grind out his opponents, utilizing a grapple-heavy game plan, which is, like I said, from the Niagara Top Team guys, that's kind of their their mo that's how they usually get their wins is just by overpowering guys getting them to the ground grinding them out finding a submission or getting that ground and pound from on top unless they go out there and just grind them over the 15 minutes and win that way but i think he can do that here against morgan ryan's morgan ryan's decent striker has some good power in his shots five and five record you know 500 record essentially but the gabe sagman fight is really all we need to kind of hone in on i know that fight was coming up on three years ago now but knowing that guys like uh, tyler wilson and gabe sagman can get him to the ground and grind him out is more than enough reason for me to believe that tisha has a layup in this matchup unless he's not able to get the takedowns which i just do not see happening i i know he's going to get the takedowns 
Morgan could possibly crack him, but Tiche has shown a great beard on him. He has very much improving striking as well. He throws a big heat, blitzes forth, throws a lot of big shots as well. But his own game plan usually is to take fights to the ground and dominate his opponents on the mat. I think he could do that without much issue here against Morgan Ryan. So give me Tiche Gutro minus 1,000. You know, always tough to, to justify paying a price tag like that, even if I do believe this fight is a layup for Tiche Gutro. Just be careful with it. It's MMA. Anything can happen. But I really think that Tishi Gutro thrives in this matchup and grinds this one out. All right. Next up, co-main event here. We got Scott Hudson taking on former Contender Series veteran Austin Tweedy. In terms of odds, we got minus 180 on Scott Hudson and plus 150 the return on the returning Austin Tweedy, who has not been in competition for over three years now. Last time we saw him in action was against Chris Brown, uh, who just picked up the LFA title last weekend. Uh, and Chris Brown went out there and got the win um, against uh, Austin Tweedy via a, just a, a variety of strikes and a striking onslaught. Similar to how Chris Brown won the title last weekend, he did the same thing to Austin Tweedy, eventually knocking him out halfway through that first round, showcasing that he was a superior fighter that night. Austin seems to have a, you know... I think he prefers getting fights to the ground if he's to have success. He throws some good shots on top uh, while he's in the striking realm. But I think that Scott Hudson is prepared enough and 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 seasoned enough to see those shots coming, utilize his own striking, and then look to get this fight to the ground and possibly grind out Austin Tweedy himself. Scott Hudson is a staple in the Southern Ontario MMA scene. Uh, you know, fought the who's who pretty much is, since way back in 2012 when he made his professional MMA debut. I even remember when I was working for the Score Fighting Series back in October of 2012, and he took on Kyle Post and finished him near the ending of that first round with knees and punches. Big win for him there and solid spot. He did lose his first fight in his next fight against Jeremiah Wells, but we all know how Jeremiah Wells has done and how good of a fighter he is too. He has since lost it three more times against Craig Shintani, Andrew Law, and Kyle Prepelik, who, again, for the Canadian scene, are some of the higher level guys that we'll see north of the border. But right now, Scott Hudson is currently riding a six-fight winning streak. The last victory he picked up was a split decision victory over Xavier Nash back in March of this year. Uh, you know, hard fought victory, both guys having success, but Scott Hudson ultimately being the one that landed a tad bit more damage. I'm not the most sold on Scott Hudson in this matchup to take that minus 180. Uh, I do think that he wins this fight. I think he is the better striker. As long as he can tuck that chin and hide it from the big power that's going to be coming from the Austin Tweedy side, I do think he goes out there and wins this fight with a complete mixed martial arts package from the striking to the grappling, to the jujitsu. I know that Scott Hudson has all the tools to defeat a, a powerhouse like uh, Austin Tweedy. And I do want to give a quick shout out to our guys over there at Ruby Sports and Entertainment, who also uh, manage Mr. Handsome Scott Hudson. So very excited to see how he uh, works out this weekend against Austin Tweedy. But minus 180, again, a little bit too wide, minus 180 on Scott Hudson, but I do think he wins this fight. All right, main event of the night, MMA veterans going out of here where we got um, <clears throat> Shane Shaolin Shane Campbell going up against Darren Smith Jr. In terms of odds, we got minus 155 on Shane Campbell and plus 125 the return on Darren Smith Jr. Now, Shane Campbell is riding a five-fight winning streak and has completely overhauled his game since the last time we saw him inside the UFC. He did uh, go one and four in the UFC with his lone victory coming over Elias Silvero back in August of 2015. He ends up losing his next three fights against stellar competition. The aforementioned, you know, well, not the aforementioned, but, you know, the uh, the guy hot in the uh, the news cycle over the last couple of weeks, uh, James Cross defeated him, up, defeated him by decision. Eric Koch choked him out. And then Philippe Silva, uh, a huge striker who was 7-0 at the time, knocks him out a minute into that fight. But since that matchup, he's gone up against stiff competition and came out with his hand raised. You know I mean, unless he's going over there to Russia to fight the, the Magomeds and all, all that over there, he is coming out there and, and beating most of his opponents that they're putting in front of him. Great striking, which we know is his base, but he's really rounding out the grappling part of his game as well, which I think is going to be his calling card in this matchup against Darren Smith. Darren Smith is a 30 
two or sorry, 34 fight veteran of the MMA game. And most notably came up short against Chris Curtis back in January of 2020. And since that fight, he got knocked out by Roosevelt Roberts in 32 seconds back in December of 2021, picked up two wins over his last two fights. The most recent one coming in LFA where he was able to get Jacob Rosales to the ground by smashing him a couple of times on the feet and then eventually getting him out of there with hammer fists on the ground midway through that second round. The guy has good striking. Uh, he seems to not really overextend on a lot of punches, but it seems to me as though he'll be giving up a little bit of size and reach here. He comes in at 5'9 with a 70-inch reach, whereas Shane Campbell, six foot tall with a 71-inch reach. But I think that we'll see that height be the difference maker here with Shane utilizing his kicks to keep Darren Smith at distance. And then whenever he feels comfortable, I think we'll see him close the distance, look to get this fight to the ground. But I think that Shane is the better overall fighter here. I think he's the better striker. And I'm not impressed with a lot of the things that I've been seeing from Darren Smith. I think that this is a great fight for Shane Campbell to get his hand raised in. And I think at minus 155 is a generous line for him in this spot too. So uh, unless Darren Smith on course a bomb, which he's, he is capable of doing, I do think that Sh Shane Campbell will overwhelm him with a complete mix of martial arts game and win this fight likely by decision. There you guys go. All nine fights, quick picks in less than 25 minutes for you guys. Hopefully you guys are able to make it out to the show. Like I said, it's taking place at the International Center. I believe the first fight kicks off in just about an hour and a half or so. So if you're in the area, come on through. Link to the tickets are in my description below. And if you can't make it out there, check it out on Fight Pass. Because it'll be going down live on Fight Pass as well. Um, again, New Fight MMA, one of the premier promotions inside Ontario. Or sorry, inside Canada. I believe it's only the second promotion in Canada to get a deal with Fight Pass as well. So big, big things happening for them. Hopefully I'll see some of you guys out there. If you guys see me, say what up. I'll happily say what up as well. And uh, hopefully enjoy a great night of fights. Shout out to the Unified guys again. And hopefully this is not the last time that they come back to Toronto because I think that they'll get a great reception, uh, especially with bringing that type of promotion, that level of promotion to the East Coast. All right, appreciate everybody for checking out the quick breakdown show here. Again, UFC fights tomorrow. CFFC tonight as well. I got four bets for CFFC, which I posted on the Patreon. Make sure you guys check that out. I'll be keeping tabs on that myself. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Ooh, is the, car, is the audio still out? Sorry, guys. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. All right, I just quickly changed up the audio there. But yeah, uh, CFFC bets post on the Patreon. That goes down tonight as well. Fury FC will be going down on Sunday. I'll be doing breakdowns for that over the next couple, uh, uh, well, over the next 24 to 48 hours. So keep your eyes out for that. Uh, and then obviously UFC fights tomorrow. I'll be dropping all my bets. Well, actually, no. I'm on a three event winning streak or longer. So bets are only going to be on beyond the Patreon paywall. Um, I know this isn't working right now, so it's only the mic from there. So there's no point in talking in that. Uh, I'll be dropping the dog that I play for free later on tonight. So keep your eyes on my social media for that. Otherwise, good luck on all your bets this weekend, folks. And I'll see you guys uh, in two weeks. I'll be doing a breakdown for Bellator, uh, Bellator versus Risen on the New Year's Eve show. All right. Love you guys. Appreciate you guys. And I'll catch you guys in about two weeks. Peace.